Gamma Fa Hori. This is the place where I tap into the deepest, darkest magics of the Earth and combine them with the latest, most cutting edge, high tech wizardry coming out of Silicon Valley, China, Japan, and that secret base on the moon nobody wants you to know about. Why have I come to this dark, mysterious, and dangerous place? Well, it's not really that big of a deal. Uh, it's just, I noticed, uh, as I started reviewing Preacher, watching it, and as I uh, wrapped up my introduction, I was really just boiling over with so much anger, and there's sure, you know, fanboys, we get butt hurt when things aren't the way we want them to be. And that's why we're fanboys, but the anger that I was feeling after that episode, and just turned me into someone I don't want to be. So I've come down here to my Necronama Oratory to purge myself of this toxic, unhealthy anger that is just probably something about like something I got embarrassed about in second grade that I can't let go of, or like that time my butt fell out in like gym class in seventh grade and everybody called me fat ass for six years. But that's not the point. Using the magical ingredients I have gathered, an ancient spell created by druids like a whole long time ago for stuff like this. Just give me a second here. Uh, allrecipes.com. Witchcraft. Yep, yep, okay. I have the boiled breast milk of an underage albino goat herder. The ectoplasmic ooze of the ghosts of all the slimiest former Republican presidents. And of course, the putrefied schmegma of an ancient Egyptian prostituta. Now, I'm just missing one ingredient. The blood of a virgin. Well, I don't know any virgins. This is gonna be tough. I don't wanna kidnap any babies or small children. It's gotta be something else. I mean, what if I don't have virgin blood? I mean, come on, what if I don't have virgin blood? Where are you supposed to get virgin blood at this time of day? Oh, okay, okay, okay. It says here, it says here, that uh, if you cannot find the pure blood of a true virgin, you only need to get the blood of a 30-something-year-old loser who hasn't gotten laid in so long, and when he does get laid with such infrequency that he may as well be a virgin. Well, that's, that's going to be impossible to find. I don't know anybody like that. Me and my boys just crush mad birth canal on girls all the time. Uh, this is going to be impossible. Uh, all right, hold on, hold on a second. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go find this fucking, one of these weird losers out there who's like 36 and doesn't get laid whenever he wants to by anyone. I'm going to go find this weirdo and I'm going to fucking cut him open and I'll be back. Oh, all right, I did it. It wasn't easy, it wasn't easy at all to find a guy down the street who was a big enough loser for that kind of virgin blood, but I found it, and now we can go on with the ritual as planned. Okay. Now we must place the ingredients in the chalice of the sacred golden calf. First, the ectoplasmic ooze of the slimy, slimy Republicans, Richard Nixon, George W. Bush. Ugh, you guys are gross. Ugh. Next, the fucked up breast milk. Oh, man. Ugh. God, that is wretched. Why would I smell it? Oh, God, why do I keep smelling this wretchedness? Uh, oh, God. Oh, it's so fucking gross. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. All right. Whew. Whew. I'm going to do the schmegma last. I'm going to do the schmegma last. We're doing my blood, and we're doing the blood of the guy that's not me, that's a virgin. Oh god! Oh fuck! This milk is so gross on its own. Hold on a second. Oh, hold on a second. Alright, hold on a second. 
Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. I need a mystical fucking cocktail. Oh, fuck. I want to get this over with and shit, but, like, fuck you right now. Oh, God. Okay. Okay. The fucking... Let's just... Clean it clean. The fucking... Schmegma. second now. I'm gonna get my composure. Hold on. I have to, I have to have a steel will. I have to have an iron will. I have to have an iron will. I have to have an iron will. All right. It's time to drink the potion. All right. The potion is ready. All I have to do now is say the magic phrase and I will finally be able to curb this rage inside of me that just burns like the urine of a pit bull with genital herpes. Oh, that's unpleasant. I don't think this is going to be especially pleasant. Well, here we go. The words. I should have written down the words. I know how it begins. Okay. Ancient spirits of evil! By the power of Grayskull! la da da dee da dee da dee da dee da dee da da dee abracadabra Platu! Lorata! Bigma! realities and and every single one of them had a really crappy knockoff preacher TV show this preacher TV show doesn't seem all that bad now I mean I'm not gonna lie to you I'm skeptical as hell I'm one of the most skeptical people you'll ever meet ever in the world not cynical not cynical not cynical optimistic but skeptical anyways there's a ton of differences between the preacher show on AMC and the preacher comic written in the 90s by Garth Ennis and penciled by Steve Dillon. 
If you've never read the comic, please read the comic. Like, I don't care if you read the comic before you watch this show. I don't care if you get spoilers. If you don't care about spoilers. If you do care about spoilers, you're dumb for watching a show that is about comparing things that have already been on. Having said that, I cannot stress enough that you need to read the original Preacher graphic novel trade paperback single issues, whatever you can get! Steve Dillon's art is very clean, but at the same time, nobody draws gore and violence like he does. I compare him to Mike Allred, but honestly, Mike Allred doesn't quite have the same chops as Steve Dillon. Steve Dillon's work has a kind of gritty realism to it. He complements the gritty writing style of Garth Ennis so well. That's why the two of them are such an amazing team. They also did a run on Punisher together. You might want to check out their run on Punisher. There's a ton of stuff out there. I mean, there's so much Garth Ennis stuff out there and Steve Dillon stuff out there and so many other people I want to talk about. But we'll spend more time on the creators and their other work later on in the series. For now, let's talk about this effing show, all right? Okay, it's not a bad show. And what I want to do from the get-go is talk about some of the things I really liked in the pilot of Preacher. First off, the casting. I'm a huge fan of this cast, for the most part. Jesse, I'm not sure about. You know, I watched Jesse Custer fight in this show, and I have a feeling he's never taken a real punch before. Like, he doesn't know how to sell a punch. Now, if you're not a wrestling fan, first of all, you're fucking up. Second of all, selling is uh, how a wrestler fakes being hurt. Now, uh, is not good selling. That's me making a stupid uh, noise and uh, gesture for uh, comic effect. Good selling is what makes pro wrestling good, and it also is what makes acting good, since, you know, they're kind of related. See, I'm not impressed. I'd fight him. I'd fight him. On the other hand, I love the casting for Tulip, and I love the casting for Cassidy. Now, Tulip's character in the show already is very different than she starts out in the comic. However, the general spirit of Tulip that this actress nails is... Well, she's kind of playing the young Tulip, the Tulip that first knew Jesse before a lot of shit went down. Uh, and Tulip in the comics is a very, very deep character um, with a very rich story. I hope they go into her family and her friends on the TV show because Tulip's got an awesome story. She's a sweet girl. She's a great girl. I fucking love Tulip O'Hare. Oh, I fucking love Tulip. And the casting of Cassidy, uh, the dude from Misfits, the last couple seasons of Misfits that weren't very good, but he was very good on them, and I really love him as Cassidy. You know, he's friggin' got the crazy energy of a frenetic Irish junkie vampire, the way I always imagined he would have. So, kudos to you, uh, dude whose name I'll look up and uh, say eventually. I'm also not a big fan of the casting of Sheriff Root and... Arseface, but Arseface, I can't really blame the casting so much as the makeup crew who decided this kid needed to look, like, kind of attractive. Like, maybe that's his agent, maybe that's the actor himself, maybe that's the director, I don't know who decided that Arseface has to have nice eyes and be kind of cute, decide despite his, you know, his asshole mouth, uh, be kind of fucking cute. Uh, that's not my Arseface. So, and I'm just now realizing I was supposed to be only talking about the good parts of the show, and I got through two cast members I liked, and then I kind of trailed off. The show really nails the comic's quirky sense of humor. Uh, I love the first uh, opening scene when Jesse walks past the sign of the church and they've rearranged it to say, open your ass and holes to Jesus. That's funny. Uh, it, it's in the style of the Preacher comics kind of body humor. And Garth Ennis, by the way, if you haven't read Rifle Brigade, and while Preacher is a dark show with a serious tone, it gets a little silly sometimes. It's fucking pretty silly. The violence is pretty fucking silly. The portrayal of the citizens of Anvil is very true to the comic. I mean, there are a bunch of shit heels. They were only around for a few pages in the comic. It looks like they're going to be around for the, the entire first season of the fucking show. I don't know. I don't know. One episode deep. Aw, oh, Sheiky Baby. Come on, Sheiky Baby. Two other things I really liked about the show is I like that they included the Willie Nelson Time of the Preacher song. It's in the beginning of the comic. It's really cool for the tone of the show, so kudos to you on being smart enough to pay Willie Nelson to put his song in your fucking show. And while I'm talking about the opening, the beginning scene when Genesis' his comet screams across the spaceways, oh man, I thought that was super cool. I thought that was a really nice way to show Genesis. Um, but, alright, alright, let's get into the things now that I don't like. Maybe don't like is a little harsh. I mean, I don't know. Maybe it was the potion. I don't really feel all that pissed off right now. I'm not all that butthurt. I just am confused about some of the changes and 
So basically it comes down to some of them are, you know, no big whoop. Some of them are kind of a whoop. And uh, some of them are big fucking whoops. Now this is going to be kind of an overview since it is the first episode and we've got a long way to go to get through this show. And I don't want to talk about everything completely on ad nauseum over and over and over again every single episode. So I'm going to touch on the main things in the first episode that are super fucking different and kind of maybe ruin the story. Right away, there's the multiple creatures that are getting filled up with Genesis, and they're all like, Oh, I think I have powers! And then they explode, okay? And uh, they do it to the African guy, they do it to some guy in a satanic church, and they do it to Tom Cruise, because who's not tired of Tom Cruise's crazy jokes, right? Even though his Scientology is more of like, you know, an evil cult than a funny joke at this point, they're still in Hollywood, so, you know, whatever. Seth Rogen, <laughs> them Scientologists, <laughs> The reason that it's kind of dumb to have all of Genesis fly into all these different other preachers is because in the story, Genesis's parents, now here we go, all right? This is your only fucking spoiler warning for the whole fucking series, all right? I'm gonna talk like I don't care. In the comic, Genesis's parents are a male angel and a female demon, specifically a Seraphi angel of the warrior cast, right? So he, fi he falls in love with this evil demon that he sees while he's guarding the perimeter of heaven. She's getting to him because she's a horny bitch because she's a demon. And, uh, you know, they start banging, or at least they bang once. But that's really all it takes because angels and demons are not supposed to bang. So here's the thing about Genesis. He has parents that fucking awesome as hell. I mean, they're from heaven, so they're an angel and a demon. But more importantly than that, his parents were not supposed to be together. And because of their coupling and the birth of Genesis, God sees the potential, his potential demise now that there is a being more powerful than him in the universe. That is the core of the story and also the reason that Genesis meets up with Jesse Custer. Because Jesse's parents, well, we're going to talk about Jesse's parents a little bit later on in this episode. Alright, I mentioned earlier that I really like the casting of Tulip and Cassidy. However, I do not really like their portrayals so far. Tulip, in the comics, finds Jesse by accident after she'd given up on finding him for years. Now, when she stumbles upon Jesse, it's after he has obliterated his entire congregation in Anvil when Genesis smacks him, gives him the word, turns a big, creates a big fucking light show, and massacres the whole town in one shot. Oh, there's so many, so many little details that are so different. I'm gonna just try and stick to the main things, the most important things. So one thing that's got my mind completely fucking boggled is the fact that when we first meet Cassidy, he's on an airplane with a bunch of vampire hunters. For some reason, they all tricked him into getting on a plane and they were gonna wait to bust out their weapons and fight him until he got to the sun, I guess was their plan or how they caught up to him. What a stupid setup! I'm sure there'll be like a big flashback later on in the series where they explain that really ridiculous plot hole of Cassidy even being on the plane with vampire hunters. But then again, maybe he's hunting the vampire hunters because he makes a phone call to somebody. Anyways, there's, there's no vampire hunters in Preacher, okay? There's only ever been two other vampires in the comic. Uh, the one who bites Cassidy in the first place, some weird old swamp hag, and Icarius, the douchebag Cassidy doesn't like, who isn't around by this point in the story. Uh, when we get to that later, you know, when we get into Cassidy's backstory, we'll find out more about Icarius and the hag. God, oh my god, that's not even the worst thing about Cassidy, you know. The worst thing about Cassidy, and, okay, so, I haven't been given a big, good, a good scale of the whoops, right? So we're talking about, like, Genesis into the Preachers, okay? That's not much of a whoop, you know, that's no big whoop, okay? Uh, uh, Anvil not getting destroyed, that's kind of a huge whoop so far. Uh, but the, uh, one of the biggest whoops, the biggest whoops, the second biggest whoop I'm going to talk about today is when we first meet Cassidy... The first thing that blew my mind when I saw this show that made me flip the fuck out was Cassidy's eyes. Now, in the comic book, Cassidy's eyes are fucked up, right? But they're not fucked up because he's a vampire. They're fucked up because he's a junkie, okay? They're not, I guess in the show, you know, they're just about casual, fun cocaine use because that has been a cool thing ever since, you know, cocaine came back like 10 years ago on the scene, I guess. It's like a hip thing. The hipsters love cocaine, right? Probably because they grew up on Adderall. Maybe that's why they, you know, they couldn't. They, they wanted to grow up after Adderall, so that's why they, you know, they got into cocaine. Cassidy always wears sunglasses in the comics because 
his eyes are fucked up, and he doesn't want people to see him. But right away from the get-go, we have Cassidy's eyes on display. Gorgeous, beautiful Irish eyes, smiling away. When Irish eyes are smiling. Blah, 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 blah. The whole point of Cassidy hiding his fucked up eyes behind his shades is that Cassidy hides his fucked up self behind his shades. And it's the fucked up junkie that is the real Cassidy, not the cool exterior. And that's the important part of not seeing Cassidy's eyes. So it's going to be interesting. I'm sure they'll still get the point across in the show. I'm sure they'll still uh, make Cassidy kind of a not hero. Like, I don't want to call him an anti hero. He's a not hero. Uh, he just happens to be hanging around a hero, and when shit's going down, he likes to fight. So that's Vice Cassidy, you know? See, I hate the scene. The little kid talks to Jesse. They ask him for help with his dad. Not that part, but the part where he's like, People say before you came here, you used to do things. And I'm just like, what a stupid hackney cliche. Like, first of all, there's all these rumors about what a badass preacher he is, right? Because I guess he's probably going to be... The way they're setting it up, it seems like he's from Anvil. Like, oh my god, I hate this show. Yeah, the fact that apparently everybody knows about his badass backstory, and uh, it's kind of stupid. And it's really kind of hacky of the writers. I love super bad. don't get me wrong. But maybe that's why this hacky-ass line had to be put in there. Oh my god, there's another really hacky-ass line in the show when Tulip meets back up with Jesse, and uh, she's like, oh, one more big job, and you're like, not the map, but the one more big job, one more big score, huh? Oh my god, that's not in the comics. That's not why Tulip never comes back to find Jesse for a score. Tulip stumbles upon Jesse by accident. And speaking of things with Tulip, oh my god, that have nothing to do with the comic. The whole, like, cornfield action sequence, that's a nice, cool action sequence, it's a fun way to start the show, so she can get the map. The homemade bazooka with the fucking redneck white trash kids, and then they do the whole out. Oh god, the whole like you can't see the action, but the action's happening, and the kids are like, "Oh, I'm scared of this." She might eat a bazooka, and you get a nice payoff when they show the dude with all the shit in his face, all the shrapnel shit in his face. But Tulip doesn't fucking make bazookas, all right? Tulip knows how to use guns. Oh god, oh god, I'm allergic to it. I'm allergic to the show. My eyes itch. My eyes itch from the show. I'm beginning to think I probably should have drank the potion. I don't think I don't think that smelling and puking is enough. I should have drank the whole fucking thing. I'm pretty fucking sure at this point. Tulip's good with guns because of her dad. And that's another important part of Tulip that's probably going to come up later in the show, so I'll talk about Tulip's dad when Tulip's dad comes up. Back to the town of Anvil in the show, like, it's bad enough that they're not all dead as soon as he gets Genesis and this whole town, but like, all these characters in the town, I don't need any of them. I don't care for any of them. I really hope that very soon in the next couple episodes, either Genesis or the Santa Killers wipes this town out so we can get the show on the road. This preacher is supposed to be taking place on the road. It's a quest. It's a journey. It's not, I'm going to sit here and be good preacher. It's nothing at all in the comic at the end of the show, by the way. Holy fuck. I guess I'll have to get to that later, right? But yeah, like... The minivan, single mom, waitress, who obviously has a crush on Jesse, who's got real anger problems and smashes her kid's fucking iPad, and that's kind of fucked up. Like, she kind of needs to drink a fucking potion, if you ask me. The Tulip's not enough of a love interest, because, especially because, you know, whatever, he's supposed to be resisting her, and even though in the comics he's all about her, and oh, 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 oh. There's like a mayor, I wrote his name down, but I don't care, because he's stupid, I don't care. Fuck the stupid mayor character, fuck him, okay? And as far as things that can be fucked, and fuckity 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 fucked, and fuck, fuck, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you for arse face, okay? What a shitty fucking arse face makeup job is the first thing I want to say. Like, I couldn't do better. I could not do better. I'm not going to fucking lie. I couldn't go anywhere near as good. Oh, man, the mouth thing looks cool. But the rest of him is so goddamn pretty. He's got a couple scratches. He looks like he's got fucking acne scars. The kid put a shotgun under his face and blew his fucking face off. And that's why he's a lot of face like an arse. And he's not a fucking pretty boy. And he doesn't have nice wavy fucking hair. And he never met Jesse before this fucking... Ugh, before Hugo Root did, before his dad did, when the Santa Killers comes to town and Jesse fucking chat up after Anvil's already gone, they never met in the comics. I hate the ending. I hate the fact that Jesse's praying for God's forgiveness in a church when he gets Genesis, as opposed to telling God to fuck off, which is what he does in the comic. 
Uh, because you can't tell God to fuck off, I guess, in America right now. We gotta, like, be real careful of pissing off the religious folks. And I think I heard somebody say something about Seth Rogen being afraid of pissing off Christians. So, again, like, fuck you, Seth Rogen. Uh, but, uh, or maybe fuck you, Evan Goldberg. Or maybe fuck you, somebody else. Fuck you, whoever decided that you can't piss off Christians on a goddamn cable TV show that's about how God's a fucking asshole in the first place. I can't stop these fingers right now! I can't stop that. I can't put them down. I can't put them down. I want to put them down. I'm going to have to go to the hospital. My th I'm getting arthritis. I can feel it. It hurts. It hurts. They're locked in place. They're locked in place from the ending of that episode. Because not only did Genesis come to him after he prays and shit and it's stupid, even though I do like the way kind of Genesis walked up to him, even though in the comic he like slams into him, what I can't get over, what I can't get over at all is when Jesse's like, I'm going to be the preacher you serve. I gave up on you. Bullshit. Bullshit. In the comic, the only reason he gets into a fight isn't because he's trying to stop some s &M bitch from getting slapped around by her husband because his son's worried about it, okay? Okay? The only reason that he goes to that bar and he gets in a fight in the comic is because he goes there already drunk and calls people out on all the shit he knows they're up to because he's the creature and everybody tells him fucking everything. And he gets his ass beat. He gets his ass beat, okay? And he gets his SB, and the only reason everyone is in Anvil, is in the church, to get demolished in the first place is because he got his ass beat in the bar, and they all go there, and Genesis comes, and they all die, and then Jewel shows up with Cassidy, because she doesn't meet him second, she meets him first, he didn't jump out of fucking plane, he jumped out of fucking truck, and died, yeah, yeah! So yeah, there are a few, um, slight differences, so far, between the Preacher Show and the Preacher comic. Holy shit, I almost forgot... The biggest whip of all. Like, I got really worked up about the ending. I fixed my hands. I mean, I was just kidding before. It's fucking... I'm, I'm kidding. It's a fucking show, right? So anyways. Jesse Custer's father. Now, this is a huge thing. Because Jesse Custer's father is a counterpoint to God in this show. Like, Jesse's father is actually a better man than God when he's in this. And that's what makes Jesse such an amazing guy. Because his dad was the shit. But one thing that his dad was not was a preacher. Jesse's dad was a Marine who fought in Vietnam. When he first came home from Vietnam, a beautiful woman who ended up being his wife spat in his face and called him a baby killer. She felt real bad about it, that's why they got together, but she was from a fucked up family, so she kind of liked having this big Marine around. And so they get together, they fuck, they have a kid, they're real fucking happy, right? And that's when Jesse's mother's family comes calling. And I know the show's going to get into it, so we'll talk about them from that. But you've already seen... We'll talk about them later. But what I will say now is they're the people that kill Jesse's dad, right? And they kill Jesse's dad not because of anything that with him being a preacher. They kill him because he's not part of their family line. They want to make Jesse a preacher. His dad doesn't want him to be a preacher. His dad wants him to be a fucking badass. His dad doesn't want him to be a fucking bitch-ass preacher serving God he doesn't believe in because some creepy old southern family forces him to. Like, that's the opposite of one of the major themes of the show. And it also makes me wonder if we're ever going to see John Wayne in the show. Now, the ghost of John Wayne visits Jesse throughout the whole comic. He hasn't been in the show yet. He might show up later. Um, I hope he does because it's also a pretty good shot that he's actually the ghost of Jesse's dad and not the ghost of John Wayne, but Jesse sees him that way. Of course, it could be anything. It could be Genesis. It could just be Jesse's nuts. I mean, he's taking a few blows to the head and had a lot to drink, right? All in all, though, I mean, I can't say it's a bad show. The action is awesome. It's a lot of fun to watch. I enjoy the show. I like getting fucking all worked up about it because I love Preachers. So I'm just glad that the subject matter now is being discussed. I'm glad that other people are being introduced to Preacher. Hopefully that means they'll get introduced to more of Garth Ennis' writing and Steve Dillon's artwork and through them fantastic other artists that I'll probably touch on over the series. I'm getting ideas for what I want to do. Isn't it wonderful? So until then, I'm having a great time. I'm glad I'm not the fucking pissed off asshole anymore. You know, I thought I'd have to drink the whole thing. I mean, I got worked up during the show. I did kind of get my fingers, you know, stuck in middle finger mode. But, um, I don't feel bad about that. You know, I got it out, and now it's gone, and I feel better. And I'm ready to watch another episode of this show, and, you know, I'm going to come at it with, uh, I'm going to come at it with an open mind and an open heart. That's a joke about another dumb part of the show. No, but seriously. But seriously. I'm open-minded about the future of this show. I know that right now it's very different from the comic. But maybe they still are going to tell a really good story. Hopefully they stick to the themes. That's the only thing that matters to me, and I'm kind of afraid they're already starting to stray from the themes. But we'll see. Until then, I'm going to... No.
go. It can't be. Who the fuck are you? Who am I? Who am I? I am the manifestation of all the anger you released in the ceremony. It's not true! It's impossible! I am a being of pure hatred for all living things and totally nasty butthurt for anything that happens to my favorite comic book series! Look, no man, I don't want to be angry anymore. I'm sick of it, okay? I don't want to be pissed off and flip out about shit. Like, it's not gonna happen anymore. I'm gonna calm the fuck down no matter what I have to do. It's not worth it in your life to just carry around anger, especially about petty shit like comic books and TV shows. It's not what's important. You may call me Half-Satan, and I'm going to do all the places you're afraid to go. <laughs> What I have to work with here. <laughs>